Today is the second Sunday of Advent, and we light the candle of peace. Last Sunday, we lit the first candle in our Advent wreath and celebrated the faith of the people in the Old Testament who looked forward to God's blessing, the hope in Christ. We light it again as we remember our Savior, born a king in the line of King David. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and we believe that he will come again to fulfill all of God's promises to us, to rule the world wisely and bless all nations. Today we light the second candle of Advent, the candle of peace. We remember the prophets who spoke of the coming of Christ, of how a Savior would be born, a king in the line of King David. Isaiah wrote, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. When Jesus came, he taught people the importance of being peacemakers. He said that those who make peace shall be called the children of God. When Christ comes to us, he brings us peace, and he will bring everlasting peace when he comes again. We light the candle of peace to remind us that Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and that through him, peace is found. Peace is like a light shining in a dark place. As we look at this candle, we celebrate the peace that we find in Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, light of the world, the prophet said you would bring peace and save your people from trouble. Give peace in our hearts this year. We ask that as we wait for you to come again, that you would remain present with us. Help us today and every day to worship you, to hear your word, and to do your will by sharing your peace with each other. We ask it in the name of the one who was born in Bethlehem. Amen. And now I invite you to listen to the messages on peace from Pastor George and Pastor Donovan. Wow, back again. Talking about the Christmas story. Greetings from Pastor George and all of the friendly folk here in Chetwin, British Columbia. I just want to recap just a few things that we shared in our, our last meditation. And, and it was the introduction to the last message was in the form of a question. And the question was, what is the message for Christmas? What is it that we want to hear? And, and I used phrases like, Merry Christmas. Is, is that sufficient? Wishing you a Christmas that's merry and bright. And you will recall, Merry Christmas with lots of love. Or simply thank God for Christmas. Enjoy it. And as we approach the Christmas season, uh, I want to remind you of a beautiful story in St. Luke's Gospel that covers a part of that story. And, and here is what's happening here in Luke chapter 2 uh, when, when Christ was born. It's a beautiful story, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the city of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel. They were praising God, and look what they were saying. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. In our last meditation, 
we talked about hope. And, and today I want us to talk about peace. Now we realize, as we looked at last week, Christmas is not just about profit. It's not just about a Santa Claus. It's not about Christmas trees and decorations and family gatherings, even though that's a lot of fun. Christmas is more than that. Christmas is a story that, yes, it brings us hope, and it's a story that brings us peace. And now we praise God for that story. When the host of angels had visited with the shepherds during their night watch, they praised God, and there, were, there was positive news to be shared. And I want to share that today. The angel said, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth for all those pleasing him. Would it not be nice to wake up in the morning and realize that we are experiencing world peace? And just as Jesus is the embodiment of hope, so he is also the embodiment of peace. And, and the Apostle Paul said of Jesus, for he himself is our peace. Amen. And, and while the angels talked about peace on the night of Christ's birth, Jesus himself said to his disciples, actually, in anticipation of his crucifixion, he said, and I quote John 14, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. The peace that is given by the world is shallow and, and shifty and without any foundation. The peace the world offers us is often a peace of escape. The peace which comes from the avoidance of trouble. The peace which comes from refusing to face and accept things. You can't have peace just in the abstentia of problems or troubles or challenges. We're talking about a peace that is internal and that comes from knowing Jesus Christ. What Jesus gives us is different from what the world gives us. The peace that Jesus gives can be summed up in an old Hebrew word called shalom. And shalom means completeness wholeness, health, fullness, rest, harmony. This peace which Jesus offers us is the peace of conquest, even in the midst of our battles of life. It is not a peace of passiveness, but a peace that keeps us motivated and keeps us moving forward. It is the peace which no experience in life can take from us as long as we trust the peace giver. It is the peace which no experience, regardless of how big, small, or indifferent, should take away from us that which God has planted by His Holy Spirit. It is the peace which no sorrow, no danger, and no suffering can make any less. It is a peace which is independent of outward circumstances. And ladies and gentlemen, because Jesus lives within us, then this peace, this shalom, is guaranteed because Jesus is the embodiment of that peace. You have Jesus, then you have this peace. Imagine completeness, wholeness, health, fullness, rest, harmony. The psalmist pinned it beautifully when he said, I will lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. What a glorious thunderous burst of energy as the angelic choir sang to the frightened shepherds, Glory be to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. 
And just prior to their song of celebration, the angel announced, Be not afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, and He is Christ the Lord. The great evangelist, the late evangelist, Dr. Bill Graham, puts it this way. He said, peace is used in the Bible mainly in three ways. Number one, there is a spiritual peace or an established relationship between man and God. There is the psychological peace or peace within the individual. And number three, there is the relational peace of having peace with humankind, peace with people all around us. And throughout the Bible, we are reminded that sin had destroyed or seriously affected all three dimensions of that peace. Our peace with God, our peace within, and our peace in relationship with others. When man was created, he was at peace with God. He was at peace with himself. And he was at peace with his fellow beings. But when humanity sinned against God, his fellowship with God was broken. He was no longer at peace with himself, and he was no longer at peace with others. Can peace be restored? Absolutely. Can we enjoy peace within our heart? Absolutely. You see, the greatest of hope and peace is made possible because the reason Jesus Christ came was to save his people from their sin. I don't know how you would interpret that, but I just want to quote directly from God's Word that He came to save us from our sin so that we might have hope and that peace again might be restored, peace with our Father God, peace within ourselves, and peace within our brothers and sisters around us. The angel said to Joseph about the pregnancy of Mary, he said, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sin. Not very often during the Christmas season do we hear a sermon on salvation. Not very often do we hear a sermon about the cross or the blood of Jesus Christ being shed or the resurrection from the dead because we want to focus upon that peace and that hope that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ, but we know it is all based on the fact that he died and he rose again. For if you tell others, now Paul said, the question is, can that peace be restored? Can we have peace today? Absolutely, absolutely. Paul said, for if you tell others with your own mouth that Jesus Christ is your Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Let me ask the question today, are you in a good relationship with God? Do you have the peace of God within your own heart? And you, are you at peace with those around you? Today, I want you to claim the peace of God that passeth all understanding. And that during this Christmas season, you will enjoy not just the presence of Jesus, but everything that Jesus brings to you. May blessings be upon you and your family. Let me just take a moment to pray, Father God, I would ask that everybody listening today will not focus on the Santa Claus of Christmas, but that we will focus on the Christ of Christmas and that hope and that peace will be ours in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Merry Christmas. God's blessings. Have a great season. Amen. Well, I don't know as it is really a band, but uh, we just get together and play together. Uh, so it, anytime uh, when people would come over to visit, we uh, would just pull out the instruments and start playing. Dad would be on the fiddle, um, Joanne, Levine, uh, Joanne on the piano, Levine on the guitar. Uh, I was usually pretty small then. So anyway, Clem, uh, he learned to play the piano again. Well, he plays lots of things. Yeah, you know, whenever we get together, it's just always been music. 
That's nothing like music. <laughs> Life wouldn't be the same without music. Places we used to go But little darling They're not there anymore So just remember me I'll remember I don't know about you, but I have some beautiful memories of this season from when I was young. I can remember getting together at the church on Saturday night, splitting into groups and going to in gathering with my friends and my church family. As the snow gently fell upon us, we would walk from house to house, all beautifully decorated with colorful lights for Christmas, and we'd sing Christmas carols together and we'd raise money, and we'd collect canned goods for our local food bank. It was peace on earth and goodwill toward men, at least until my fellow ingatherers began to think that maybe I was old enough to go to the door and do the talking for them. Now, thankfully, you know, following Jesus' model of sending out the disciples two by two, they also sent my good friend Julie with me. And unlike me, Julie had a real gift for... Uh, confidently communicating with others. Now, our little church was just out of town, up the hill, nestled in by a little pond. And every year, if it was cold enough, uh, we would shovel off the pond, bring down a generator uh, and some floodlights. We would make a huge pot of hot chocolate and have a special church skating night uh, down on the pond. This was the one time of year that I really ever remember my dad pulling out his skates. There was usually a hockey game, uh, and it wasn't unheard of for deacons and elders to get a little rowdy. Uh, there would always be an inevitable crash of some sort, you know, limbs flailing, uh, but above it all, hearty laughter as, as the deacon and the elder began to slowly untangle themselves from one another and try to get back up on their feet. You know, I'll tell you what, after having experiences like that, with my much-loved church family. There was never any generational awkwardness uh, between me, my friends, and the rest of our church. Everybody was uncle this, and auntie that, and it wasn't just names. People really acted like family too. You know, a couple of years back, I got to go back home for Christmas, and my old church had a special Christmas get-together, complete with a team scavenger hunt where we ran around the downtown Kelowna uh, looking for stuff on a list, solving riddles together. You know, I couldn't not go. And so off I went with my auntie and my uncle. And you know what? Even in the midst of this crazy time, uh, you know, when everybody's so divided, families and communities are fractured, friendships have been decimated, and battle lines are drawn, you know, my old church family, was still the same. Now people have come and people have gone. Some of the faces were familiar and some were new, but the spirit of love and laughter and family was, was still just as strong as it always was. You know, even thinking about it now, this makes my heart feel good. Can you imagine, in this day and age, a family that actually wants to be together uh, a family that, despite its diversity, despite its differences, actually likes each other. You know, in my old church family, you'll find people on the right and you'll find people on the left. You'll find driven people. You'll find laid-back folks. Uh, you'll find long-time Christians. You'll find people that are new to this whole pilgrimage. Professionals, tradespeople, retirees, children, and everyone in between. It doesn't matter. Sure. They have disagreements, and no, they do not all see eye to eye. But they look past that. They look beyond it. Uh, they share a bond that's much, much deeper than, than a friendship of convenience. It's seen them through adversity, through loss, through leadership tr uh, transitions, and more. Some might call it the peace that passes understanding. Where does it come from? 
Is it because by some miracle, my old church family, they all have this perfect brew of personalities that somehow goes together despite their differences? Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, I love them and I miss them and I think of them often, but I really don't believe that their bond has anything to do with their own individual selves. I would like to take a few moments, as we think about that, to turn our attention towards the book of Ephesians. Uh, in chapter 4, right there in the beginning, the Apostle Paul lays out a roadmap for peace in the family of God. Follow along with me, if you would, uh, starting in verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to one hope when you are called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. That's why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and he gave gifts to his people. It's Ephesians 4, 1 through 8. But did you catch that? I mean, there's a lot in there, a lot. But I believe it holds the keys to that bond of peace that passes understanding. You know, it starts right there in the first words when Paul calls himself a prisoner for the Lord. Paul's writing this letter from prison where he's serving time for sharing the message of Jesus. But despite his adversity, is he upset? No. He recognizes his problems, yes, but instead of spending his time worrying about uh, his problems or writing letters of complaint to the authorities, he's far more concerned with his church families. Uh, how how his brothers and sisters and, and children and mother and father in Jesus, how they're doing. You know, these days, we too, as the saying goes, have 99 problems. But by God's grace, we uh, can look not at ourselves and our own issues, but instead ask ourselves how God can use us to help others despite our current situation. Because no matter what your own situation might be right now, God has a purpose for you. Your life is not meaningless suffering. Uh, you've been ordained to a mission, and, and that is to make a difference in the world around you. And that's why Paul urges us in the exact same sentence in which he briefly mentions his own situation, to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. You are chosen. You may not be where you want to be right now, but you just may be where you are for such a time as this. Now you may have noticed in this passage that Paul's not actually advocating for unity of opinions on the vast majority of topics. He points out there's one body uh, or church of believers. Um, there's one Holy Spirit. There's one a hope in Jesus, one Lord Jesus Christ, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. You know, it's nice if we can agree on more than that. But if we have those seven things in common, there is more than enough to form that bond of peace between us, despite our differences. If we share our one faith, baptism, our uh, family of believers, uh, our Holy Spirit, our Lord Jesus Christ, and our God and Father in heaven, then it doesn't matter what comes between us. You are my brother, you're my sister, you're my auntie and my uncle. It doesn't matter to me if you support Trudeau or if you prefer O'Toole or Singh. You might be pro-vaccine, you're whatever reason you might shy away from it. Maybe you're a vegetarian, maybe you're a baconator. Uh, if we make every effort to keep this bond of peace together though, then we can still share a unity of the Holy Spirit. Now maybe it's partly because I was so lucky to grow up in a loving family and a wonderful church environment, but having experienced what can be, it absolutely breaks my heart to see what so often is. And so I ask myself, you know, why don't, why don't I experience this same bond of peace and unity in the Spirit everywhere I go? I mean, you know how it is. 
half the time, it's actually a challenge to pick out those who follow Jesus from, from those who don't. And that shouldn't be the case. Now, Jesus made it clear in John 13, 35, when he said, By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples, that you have love one for another. Instead of that, what we see far more often is the prophecy of Matthew 24, 12, where Jesus said, speaking of the time of the end, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. That's awful. And yet, it doesn't just apply to those outside of our Father's forever family. Inside the doors of our very own churches, the love of many is growing cold. And so you ask yourself, why? Let's turn back to Ephesians 4.2 and take a look at that. Ephesians 4.2 says, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Humility. You know, I think, I think humility is what's been lost. Um, the art of putting others above ourselves. Putting others' health. Putting others' well-being. Putting others' joy above our own. You might argue that some of us have been doing this for years, and, and where is the joy? Where is the love? You know, I would respond by saying, if you're just putting uh, others above yourself out of a sense of duty, or of conflict avoidance, or because you think that you have to, then that's not what Paul's speaking about at all. The kind of humility that Paul's speaking about is the humility as a response to what Jesus has done for us. And Philippians 2 describes this kind of humility when it tells us our relationship with one another, we should have the same mindset as did Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, uh, taking on the form of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross. Wow. And because of his willingness to give it all up for the love of the human race, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow on heaven and on earth and below the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, did you notice that even in his exaltation, Jesus still isn't seeking glory for himself. It's all to bring glory to God the Father. And we should do likewise. Because if we live humbly like Jesus did, with true humility by the power of the Holy Spirit within us, then gentleness, like a bud on a rose bush, will bloom from within. Patience will grow from our once cold hearts like a flower bursting forth from the hard earth. And love? Love will be our response in every situation. You know, maybe your heart isn't feeling very loving this Advent season. But you need to remember, love is not just an emotion. You know, the result of a series of events. Love is a choice that you can make. And love is an action. You want peace on earth and goodwill toward men? Choose to love. Choose to put yourself second. Choose to live in faith and not in fear. Choose Jesus as Lord, acknowledging God as Father, and experience the union of the Holy Spirit. Don't look around you and be discouraged that so many hearts are growing cold. Don't look within you and, and let your circumstances bring you down. Look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, the Prince of Peace. Rejoice, Paul says, in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, bring your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.